Welcome to Lesson 7C, Method of Repeating Variables. In this lesson, we'll go through the step-by-step -step procedure for dimensional analysis that we call the method of repeating variables. We'll also introduce the Buckingham Pi theorem. We'll discuss guidelines for choosing repeating variables and for manipulating the pi parameters. We'll illustrate this step-by-step -step procedure with an example problem. And we'll do another example to show how to apply the results to experimental design. The method of repeating variables is basically a cookbook recipe with six steps. I'll go over these briefly and then we'll do an example to illustrate how to do this procedure. First we list the parameters and count their total number n. Parameter generally means a variable like a speed or a length. We list the primary dimensions of each of these parameters and then we set the reduction j as the number of primary dimensions. Once we know n and j we calculate k which is the expected number of pi's. k equal n minus j. This is called the Buckingham Pi theorem, namely that k equal n minus j, where n is the total number of variables and j is this reduction. As we'll see in later examples, picking j as the number of primary dimensions does not always work. If it does not work, we reduce j by 1 and try again. This may seem strange and arbitrary, but you'll see what I mean later on. Step 4 is to choose j repeating parameters. Once we establish j, we pick j of these initial n parameters or variables to be called repeating parameters. This is often the most mysterious step. There are guidelines that I show below, but it will take some practice to know how to do this wisely. Step 5 is to construct the k pi's. Remember k is the number of pi's that we expect and then manipulate. I'll also show you how to manipulate these as necessary. Finally we write the final functional relationship and always check algebra to make sure that our pi's are non-dimensional. The final functional relationship after we go through all these steps is that the dependent pi is a function of the independent pi's. This is actually the goal of this whole procedure, namely to get pi 1 as a function of the other pi's. This is the final result of our analysis. I mentioned choosing j repeating parameters. I'll show you some guidelines for choosing these repeating parameters or variables. We never pick the dependent variable. That would defeat the purpose because that variable would then appear potentially in all the other pi's. We choose repeating parameters that must not by themselves form a dimensionless group. Otherwise it would be impossible to generate the other pi's. Here's an important one. The chosen repeating parameters must represent all the primary dimensions in the problem. Never pick parameters that are already dimensionless. They're already pi's by themselves. For example, if you have an angle, an angle in radians is dimensionless, so you would not pick that angle. Never pick two parameters with the same dimensions or with dimensions that differ by only an exponent. For example, don't pick a length and an area. Whenever possible, choose constants rather than variables so that only one pi contains the variable. As an example, it's better to have g, gravitational acceleration, as a repeating variable than to have some other variable acceleration in the problem. Pick common parameters since they have the potential of appearing in each of the pi's. And finally, pick simple parameters over complex ones whenever possible. Some speed, some length, density are usually good choices. Viscosity or surface tension are usually not. Again, this comes with experience, but I generally would not want mu to appear in all my pi's. I'd rather have one pi with a mu in it and one pi with a sigma s in it, whereas these are better choices. As with many things in engineering, this is best illustrated by example. I'm going to look at drag on a car. Here's our car with some length scale L. We want to talk about the drag force, which we call F sub D. We have some air flowing with speed V and properties mu and rho. I also want to define the frontal area. This is the area that you would see looking straight on. In other words, if the car is coming toward you, what area would you see? So we have drag force as a function of the other four variables, v, rho, mu, and l. We want to express this relationship in terms of non-dimensional parameters, or pi's. So we follow the six steps, learning as we go. Step one is to list all parameters and count them. At this point, we also pick the parameter we want to designate as our dependent one. Here, fd is a function of speed v, length l, density rho, and viscosity mu. The easiest step is to count them. We count both the dependent and independent variables. Here n equal 5. Step 2 lists the primary dimensions of each parameter. I got into the habit of writing these right below our functional relationship which I repeat here. Force has primary dimensions of ml over t squared. 
For V, it's L over T. Length is just L by itself. Rho is M over L cubed. And viscosity is M over LT. That's all we do in step two, but it's critical. If you get one of these dimensions wrong, everything will be wrong in your answer. Step three is to guess the reduction, which we call variable J. Here we only have M, L, and T as primary dimensions. There's no capital T or any of the other seven primary dimensions. So we guess j equal 3 since there are three primary dimensions. As I mentioned before, if our algebra doesn't work out, we'll change j to 2, reduce it by 1, and then try again. The Buckingham Pi theorem tells us that k equal n minus j. n was 5 and j is 3, so we get 2. k is the number of pi's, n is the number of original parameters, and j is called the reduction. j is also the number of repeating variables. Since k equal 2, here we expect two pi's. Step four is to choose j repeating parameters or repeating variables. As I said, this is the most mysterious step, so make sure you study those guidelines that I showed you. Here a good choice, or I would argue the best choice, is v, l, and rho. These are simpler dimensions and more common variables than mu, as I explained previously. Now that we have our j repeating parameters, we move on to step five, which is to construct the pi's. How? Well, we take each of the remaining parameters, in this case the other two, fd and mu, one by one and combine them with these repeating variables and then force the pi's to be dimensionless. I'll start with pi 1, which we always choose as the dependent parameter. So we set pi 1 as the dependent variable in the original problem times each of these repeating variables raised to some exponent. Now the goal is to calculate these exponents which are unknown. Here's where we get into some algebra. It's not difficult, but it's tedious. The dimensions of pi 1 have to be 1, and since anything raised to the 0th power is 1, and we only have m, l, and t in this problem, I like to write it as m to the 0, l to the 0, t to the 0. And we had set up our pi 1 as this grouping, which I repeat here. Now we put in all the dimensions from step 2 f, and then v to the a, l to the b, and density to the c. These are all the primary dimensions that we had listed in step two. As you get more practice, what I'm doing now won't be necessary, but it makes life easier and is more understandable to write everything out this way. l over t to the a becomes l to the a, t to the minus a, etc. Making sure you put a negative sign on the exponent when it's in the denominator. Now we force the pi to be dimensionless. We take each of the primary dimensions represented in the problem. I'll do m first. We equate the left side with the right side. The left side is m to the 0, and the right side is m to the 1, m to the c, which equals m to the 1 plus c, equating exponents on the left and the right. 0 equal 1 plus c, which we can solve. c equal negative 1. We do the same with the other primary dimensions. For L, we get L to the 1 from here, L to the A from here, L to the B from here, and L to the negative 3C from here. We write all of them under one exponent, and then equate exponents on the right and left, which gives us this intermediate equation. We know C, but we have two unknowns here, A and B, so we can't solve this yet. We repeat for T. Skipping a little bit of algebra, we write 0 equal negative 2 minus A. You can see this here just by looking at exponents. 0 equal negative 2 minus a. There are no other t's in the equation. Sometimes we end up with two simultaneous equations or even three simultaneous equations to solve. Here we're fortunate that we can solve for a and plug that in here to get b. So a equal negative 2 and b equal negative 2. Now that we have these exponents, we go back to our pi and form our pi with these exponents, a, b, and c. So we write pi 1 equal fd, b to the negative 2, l to the negative 2, rho to the negative 1. Or pi 1 equal fd over rho v squared l squared. We're still in step 5. Now we manipulate as necessary. I'll show you some guidelines below for how to manipulate or modify the pi's. You can impose a constant dimensionless exponent on a pi. For example, you can square it or take the square root. You can multiply a pi by a dimensionless constant. For example, a pi 1 where a is some constant. You could form a product or quotient with any pi with another pi, and this will replace one of those pi's. For example, if we have two pi's, we could let one of them be the ratio of pi 2 over pi 1, 
and then this one and this one would be our two modified pies. We can do any of these guidelines 1 to 3 in combination. I can take this and square it and multiply it by some constant, for example. And finally, we may substitute a dimensional parameter in the pi with other parameters of the same dimensions. For example, replace L squared with an area, or replace area with square root of L. Why are we doing this kind of manipulation? The goal is to get each pi in a form that looks like one of the common named established non-dimensional parameters. Since people have been doing this for a long time, some of the parameters have names associated with them, like a Darcy friction factor, or a Froude number, a Mach number, a Reynolds number. Some are just kind of generic names, drag coefficient. I list several of these here, and there are a number of others in the textbook. So what we generally do now that we have our pi is look through this list and try to find one that agrees reasonably well. Our pi 1 was fd over rho v squared l squared, and we see that this is very similar to the drag coefficient. In fact, if we multiply our pi 1 by 2, that gives us a half in the denominator. And if we substitute l squared with a, the projected frontal area, we see that we can manipulate our pi into one of these more common parameters. This pi is not wrong. If you use it, you'll still get the right results when we apply it. I like to say that it's just not socially acceptable. It's more socially acceptable to use one of the named or known parameters that people have been using for decades. So here, our modified pi 1 is then pi 1 is the drag coefficient, which is defined as fd over 1 half rho v squared a. Most of you have probably heard of drag coefficient already. Well, we're only done with half of step 5. Now we take any of the other remaining parameters and form another pi. Here the only parameter or variable that we haven't used yet is mu, so we form a pi by taking mu multiplied by our repeating variables to some unknown exponents again. But the a, b, and c that we calculate for this pi will differ from the ones we had for pi 1. Again, we write the dimensions of pi 2, which is dimensionless, and equate that to the dimensions of these variables raised to the exponents. I want to mention now why we call these variables v, l, and rho that we picked as, quote, repeating variables. It's because they have the potential of appearing in all of our pi's. They're repeating in that sense. Sometimes one or more of these exponents becomes zero. So just because they're repeating variables doesn't mean they always end up in each pi, but they have the potential of doing so. I'll go through the algebra more quickly this time, going back to step two and putting in all the dimensions. These are the primary dimensions for mu, v raised to exponent a, l raised to exponent b, and rho raised to the exponent c. As we did previously, we equate the exponents on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. For m, we get 0 equal 1 plus c, or c equal negative 1. For t, we get 0 equal negative 1 minus a, or a equal negative 1. For L, we get 0 equal negative 1 plus A plus B minus 3C. Plugging in A and C, we can solve for B. I'll let you do the algebra for practice. We get B equal minus 1. Our pi 2 thus becomes mu over rho VL. Again, that's okay, but it's not socially acceptable. It's better to manipulate into one of the named common pi's, which hopefully you can see is just the Reynolds number which is our pi 2 reciprocal. Remember that we can take a pi and raise it to any exponent. Here we raised it to negative 1 to get Reynolds number. Many of our problems will have Reynolds number in them. So our modified pi 2, which is a Reynolds number. Finally, step 6 is to write the final functional relationship in the form shown previously. Here we have only two pi's. And so our final result is cd as a function of Reynolds number. Also part of step 6 is to check your algebra. Just make sure these pi's are dimensionless. In this case, we know that since they're listed in the table. Now I'll show you how to apply our result in the design of experiments. This is the same example we did previously, but now we know that cd is a function of Reynolds number. And we want to just discuss how dimensional analysis helps in the design of experiment. Originally, we had fd equal function of v, l, rho, and mu. There are four independent parameters. Imagine designing an experiment to see how fd varies with these four parameters. If you knew nothing about dimensional analysis, you might build a model car, test it in a wind tunnel at various speeds, keeping these other parameters constant and then perhaps having cars of different sizes, keeping V, rho, and mu constant. You can change the temperature of the air to see the effect of rho and mu, but you can imagine doing a lot of experiments 
to find out the full functional relationship of FD with all four of these parameters. By dimensional analysis, we've reduced this to CD equal function of RE with only one independent parameter. We have reduced the number of independent variables from 4 to 1, reduced by 4 minus 1 or 3, which is why we call J the reduction, by the way. J represents the amount of independent variables we've reduced. In terms of an experiment in a wind tunnel, by applying dimensional analysis, we don't have to go through all those tests that we talked about previously. Instead, we make a smart experiment using only one model, one temperature and pressure condition to give us one row and mu, and instead of dozens of data points, we measure drag and plot our variables as CD as a function of Reynolds number. What's useful is that not only do we reduce the number of data points we have to take, this curve applies to all values of rho, v, mu, and L. This equation holds for water or any other fluid, not just air, any speed, and any length. If we calculate the Reynolds number for our given values, we can calculate a CD at some RE1 we now can get CD1. Hopefully this demonstrates to you the power of dimensional analysis. We've greatly reduced the number of experimental data points we need to take, plus we're able to plot our results non-dimensionally. As one famous person once said, never underestimate the power of dimensional analysis. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.